Thanks, everybody. Can you hear me all right? Uh, great. So in a way, based on what Joe just said, I, I have to disappoint you uh, in the sense that I don't think you'll learn that much about NLP in your Facebook product. And uh, you'll ex I mean, I guess you'll understand why that is the case in a couple of slides. So I work at what is called Facebook AI Research, or FAIR, which was founded in 2013 by Jan Le Kuhn, who is one of the three pioneers of deep learning. Um, he won, among other things, a Turing Award for uh, his contributions to deep learning, which is, in a way, the uh, Nobel Prize of computer science. Um, he created Facebook AI Research with the following mission. mission. Um, sorry, first of all, a couple of uh, sites that we have uh, across the globe. New York, uh, Seattle, Menlo Park, etc. And recently, since last year, also one in London. And um, I guess what I wanted to say is that uh, he created FAIR with the mission of advancing the state of the art in artificial intelligence through open research for the benefit of all. And uh, that we really, I guess, do in the sense that uh, our main purpose is not to necessarily improve the Facebook product, but to do AI and AI research and do that openly and publicly. And if we can help the Facebook product, then uh, that's great, but that's not our main focus. Uh, there are a couple of values that we adhere to. Uh, one is openness. So everything that we do at FAIR is published and open sourced. Um, our researchers have complete freedom on their agenda, so nobody tells me what I should be working on, uh, including whether I should be working on the Facebook product or not. I can do that, but I don't have to. Um, we collaborate a lot with internal and external partners, uh, focus on excellence, obviously, and uh, try to operate at a scale that we can only do in this, uh, in this industrial setting. There's quite a bit of research that we do in AI across the board in different areas. Uh, machine learning in general, reinforcement learning, um, speech processing, et cetera. I will just very give you, very briefly give you an overview of some things that people have been doing at Facebook, not in NLP. Uh, for example, vision. A lot of work at FAIR, uh, especially in the early days, partly due to uh, the kind of work that Jan Le Kuhn has been doing in convolutional neural networks, has been focused on computer vision. So, uh, for example, progress that we've been making has been in the area of a predicting just uh, the class or the type of a particular image, uh, and that was work done really early, actually not here. Uh, then people moved on to really accurately extract the shapes and the types of these shapes and images. And today, with the MAST uh, RCNN technology uh, out of FAIR, you can do this much more accurately and also uh, using pose estimation at the same time. Um, we take these things and we do roll them into practice. So for example, we move this from being relatively slow on a server to working really fast on a uh, mobile device. Also substantially improve the accuracy of these tracking algorithms such that now indeed you do find some of these things in our products, for example, in the Facebook portal, uh, which is essentially this chatting device that allows you to talk to people with a screen, which is pretty much what you can do on a phone or on your tablet. But the nice thing about, tap, about portal is that it kind of tracks you while you talk so if you have a conversation with your family abroad, as uh, at least many of the people that I work with have, um, they can actually see, uh, say, kids running in, focusing on them, moving out, moving in. Um, and that really actually changes the kind of experience you can have uh, while chatting with your, with your friends abroad. I actually bought three of these devices, and, and I, I really love them. So I can highly recommend looking into those. That's pretty much as much. Uh, PR will do for products. So there have been a lot of advice, sorry, advances you know, since 2014 that we've been, been making in the space of machine learning. Um, mentioned MAST-R-CNN, uh, the other things like fast text, like um, 
essentially really fast nearest neighbor searches that uh, we have rolled out open source as well. I'm not going to go through any more of those. I do want to talk briefly about what is called PyTorch, which is, in a way, the library that drives a lot of the work that we've been doing, but also a lot of the work that people in research and industry are doing. It's an open source um, machine learning library, similar to TensorFlow, slightly different features, and um, it's been really, I think, having a great impact uh, across the board. Okay, so now let me talk a bit about natural language processing. Um, when I described uh, what I've been talking about a couple of months ago, uh, I knew I wanted to talk about unsupervised machine learning and uh, unsupervised NLP in particular, but I uh, had a sort of slightly broader application set in mind. Since then, we've made actually quite a bit of progress in a couple of uh, projects in London. And rather than talking generically about other things that people have been doing across all the global sites that we have, I want to focus and deep dive a bit into machine reading, which is one of the focus areas that we have in London, and talk about minimal supervision or no supervision in the case of machine reading. Okay. Um, so before I start, start uh, to talk about machine reading, I want to talk a bit about human reading and writing. I'll give you a bit of a origin story in a cartoonish way about uh, how sort of writing and reading came about. So there was this, um, say, Sumerian king who wanted to know, um, you know, how much coins does Rick owe him? And uh, he would ask his minion one, and minion one would be like, yeah, um, John, who isn't Rick, owes you 100 coins, that I know. Minion two is like, um, well, John brought you 50 coins uh, worth of weed, so really, he only owes you 50 coins now. And the uh, minion three would tell you, well, John's grandson, Rick, the guy you're actually asking about, he is, uh, or he just gave you back 50 coins as well. So really, at this point, he, Rick owes you nothing. Uh, which is all fine. Uh, the problem is that all of this happens somewhat distributed in time and space. So his minions would be far away, uh, say different parts of uh, his country, and also possibly temporarily much earlier placed. So maybe two generations before. And all of the information would have to be communicated. And hence, instead of saying these things, people started writing these things, and hence reading these things. Um, it was obviously incredibly important, right? Because among other things, it didn't just lead to better uh, accounting. It also led to science and many other things that I think we now all cherish. So this is all great. Uh, and in a way, it worked a little too great in the sense that today we have an explosion of data, um, partly due to the internet, partly due to other things. And hence, a question such as this one, or more meaningful questions, are a little more difficult to answer because there's just so much unstructured data out there, unstructured text that you need to gather in order to answer that question. Um, so my research is essentially about trying to figure out how we can, or programs can, read all of that information and then produce the answer for you. So how can we do this? And there are obviously a lot of applications of that. Um, for example, how do we treat diseases, right? The scientists need this kind of technology in order to uh, help their daily work. We can use it, and here's like a bit of Facebook relevance. Um, we can use it to fact check text. Like if we can read all of the web, then checking with a particular statement is true becomes, uh, becomes much easier. So that's, in a, nutshell, the, in a nutshell, the motivation for this work. So how can this be done? So there are a couple of paradigms that people have followed. I think the easiest, in a way, at least for machines, is to let humans write in machine language. Um, for example, specific, specifically in the case of accounting, you can get humans to actually you know, just enter the spreadsheets, and that's probably a good idea anyway if you're only caring about accounting. You can get humans to build these kind of 
knowledge graphs, these graphs of edges and uh, nodes where the nodes represent some kind of entities and the edges represent relations between these entities. And there exist quite a few uh, both sort of commercial and, uh, and open public databases like that that uh, have seen great use, such as Wikidata or DBpedia. Or you let them maybe write down their knowledge in logical forms of, say, predicate logic um, or things more complex. And all of that is, is doable. And in fact, it's a big part of what the semantic web sort of attitude to, to this problem is. You just let people add data already in a format that downstream machines can understand and, and the problem is somewhat solved. But of course, well, maybe adding accounting data in a tabular format makes a lot of sense and is easy for a human, probably easier than to actually write a story about it. Uh, a lot of knowledge, say about science, isn't easily to be formalized and put into a, say, logical form or even a graph. Um, that's not a natural process for humans, not as natural as actually putting knowledge into natural language. The other option is to do what I would call machine-machine translation, where the uh, idea is to go from natural language automatically to whatever you choose your machine language to be. Let's say your machine language is a graph, then you translate your statements into these kind of parts or subgraphs, and you keep on doing that for all the statements you have, and you populate your graph in this way automatically. So this, in fact, has been, I think, one of the most dominating approaches to machine reading in academia and, and in industry. In fact, if you look back to around 2006, uh, this was such an important area that DARPA, one of the defense agencies in the US, uh, who also partly funded the internet development, invested a lot of money into this program called machine reading. And uh, they had, among other things, people who developed these, these logos. Uh, one of these logos is this one, which I actually quite like because if you look closer, you see that uh, this robot actually is doing what I just told you. It sort of read the books and then transforms the books into, in this case, some form of logical form. Um, and uh, I think we came quite far with this approach, but there are a few issues with it. I guess one thing that is repeatedly found to be hard is the fact that fitting human language into a more structured, normalized, unified language is actually quite hard. You might uh, think you know what you want to capture with that language, and then a lot of things that you want to capture can be captured, but then there are new things you hadn't thought of, or subtleties you didn't capture, and it turns out you'll need them too, and so um, you find that it's sort of an uphill battle to really capture in a very structured, computer-readable form all the knowledge that you care about. Um, it's actually really hard to agree what that computer language should be. So if you work along these projects, you first spend a lot of time trying to agree on, uh, should we use this graph structure or that graph structure? Should we use this type of relation or that type of relation? Do we need this relation? Um, and, and clearly, that's related to the first problem here. So in practice, from an engineering point of view, you spend a lot of time sort of engineering what's called the schema of your language, maybe sometimes more time than you actually spend populating that. Um, then, and partly related to what I just said about how difficult it is for machines, sorry, for humans to write down their knowledge in machine language, it's hard to get supervision data for this kind of task. And because we're mostly handling these approaches through machine learning. We need examples of human language and machine language. And hence, to get these examples, we need human annotators that build those. And because that is not so easy, as I mentioned before, um, 
the process of creating this training data is not that scalable. And all of this led to, uh, in practice, quite low performance. So much so that I know of a couple of like, major um, big industry approaches to this problem or projects that all have somehow died out and people have given up on that, on that task. Like it's just not um, really easy to produce these, uh, these machine reading models that work at the appropriate precision and at the same time produce the recall that we need to really answer interesting new questions. There's sort of an alternative view to all of this, where instead of saying, let's build this one sort of structured machine representation of knowledge that then the machines can use to whatever they do, let's just look at this from the perspective of what I'd call open book knowledge, where um, rather than you know, distilling everything, you keep all your sort of books around. And whenever there is a question, you just find the right books, and then you answer that question. Um, in a way, you can do the same thing um, with a machine. And in fact, that's a dominant approach as well. So in, in this particular example, let's say somebody wants to answer the king's question. We're going to answer that by, in a way, first retrieving the most relevant documents for that king for that king's question, and then predict the answer based on this specific question from these specific documents. And this has been made possible in the last couple of years, let's say four years, through the introduction of, or the re-emergence of deep learning, and in particular technology I'd call end-to-end -end neural reading. And here the idea is to go from this question and a body of text to an answer by more or less setting up a neural network. And these three bars there are essentially three layers of a neural network that I use iconically to just represent that. Um, and this neural network does take the question as an input, and it will encode that question in one way or another. And the details are, are not that important. It will take these three documents as an input and then produce the answer right away. And if you give me a couple of training examples that consist of questions and answers and maybe these contexts, then this neural enter and model can just learn to do this kind of answering from these examples. And that's very powerful because even though it does also require to produce annotated data, um, annotating data of this type, namely natural language questions, natural language answers is much easier than annotating data of the type of machine language, sorry, human language in, machine language out. Just to be a bit more specific and realistic, actually what you see in practice and where you see most of the progress is being made is not about general question answering. It's about something I'd call, or many people would call, extractive question answering. And here the setting is as such. You're given usually a single document, maybe a paragraph of text, and you're given a factual question about that paragraph text. And the answer that you produce has to be a span, or a segment of that particular, of that particular um, document. So instead of generating free-form answers, this task only requires you to spot in the text what the right answer is. This is substantially easier. Um, I think we're really still quite far away from doing really good, open, free-form question answering work. However, for extractive QA, we have seen some quite amazing successes. Before I go there, sorry, I'll do, introduce a little bit of notation. This is pretty much as technical as it will get. I will sometimes call the questions Q. I will sometimes call these contexts or documents C. And I will sometimes call the answers A. Uh, and this will pop up later throughout the talk. All right, as I said, actually, for this specific example of extractive question answering, we have seen quite impressive uh, 
performances, um, so much so that some of the media would say robots can now read better than humans, putting millions of jobs at risk. That's not at all the uh, issue. Um, so sort of, no, we're, we're not there yet. But there has been quite a bit of progress. So let me show you what people mean by, by superhuman. Um, so if you look at the current extractive question answering accuracies we have on one of the main benchmarks in the field called the squad data set, then indeed you see that a human can answer these questions with 91% accuracy, uh, whereas the state of the art can now answer these questions with 93% accuracy, um, which is quite impressive. There are a lot of things wrong with that state of the art method still. Um, most of them I won't talk about. Uh, one of the things is that they're very, very brittle in the sense that if you add a bit of adversary, adversarial text to your input, they fail really miserably. Um, that's a whole other question. But to me, the, the really interesting bit is that um, if you look at the amount of question, context, answer, training data that the human has, it's essentially zero. I don't think many of us learn how to read by uh, sort of examples of question, answer, and document triples. Um, so we do all of this essentially just through uh, the way we learn language, not through a training set of this type. On the other hand, if you look at the state-of-the-art methods right now to get that kind of performance, they need about 100,000 of these examples. And um, obviously, that's a a problem because if you really want to use these things in practice, and uh, we had a startup uh, before we uh, became part of, of Facebook that worked in this area, and the fact that we needed that much training data was really a main blocker for all the kind of work we wanted to do with question answering in the industry. So having to build these massive data sets is uh, costly, it takes time, it's actually still a problem, even though creating natural language question answering data sets is easier than creating the kind of machine language, natural language example training data that I talked about. Um, but also if you just understand, if you're just interested in natural language understanding and how we can generally um, sort of learn how to understand language better with minimal supervision in the way that humans can, then that's not a comfortable place to be. So there's quite a bit of research that tries to look at other parts of this curve where you have less data, maybe just a tiny bit data. What I'm gonna talk about in the next few minutes is our work on looking at the case where you, really, where you really have no data. So that's what I call the unsupervised case. And uh, in order to do this, we will use some kind of breakthroughs that Facebook AI Research produced last year in the area of unsupervised machine translation. So I'll touch on that as well. All right, so let me deep dive a little more, um, talking about unsupervised question answering. This is joint work with Patrick Lewis, who is a PhD student at UCL and also working at FAIR. It's also worked with Ludovic Denoyer, who is a FAIR researcher in Paris. All right, before I talk about unsupervised question answering, I like to give you a brief sense about what supervised question answering looks like. And in a nutshell, it goes like this. Uh, you have some annotator that creates QCA data, question, context, answer data. And the annotator does that by most of the time taking some actual existing paragraph, say from Wikipedia, and uh, then within that paragraph, look for potential answers, such as Prague, and then based on that paragraph and that answer comes up with some way of creating a question that leads to that answer given that paragraph. The annotator might do this in the opposite direction. Maybe they think about the question first and then come up with the answer, but for our purposes, it actually doesn't really matter. Then, with that data, there is uh, a question answering model, usually a deep learning model, that takes that data and then learns to essentially take the context, take the question to produce an answer. Now, 
the main idea about doing all of this in an unsupervised fashion is to essentially replace the human annotator and uh, also use a machine learning model to do the annotation work. So we get a machine learning model to generate the data, which is then used by a machine learning model to learn how to do the question answering. And the way we do this is, I'd say, quite simple. You again, given a paragraph of text, and finding paragraphs of text is relatively easy. That's just essentially unlabeled data for us. So we can take any kind of text from any domain that we care about. And then within that text, we use some kind of heuristic to determine what are good possible answers. For example, you could use what is called a named entity recognizer to find city names or person names, and then choose one of these cities to be a possible answer. So that's a relatively easy step and uh, works, in fact, quite well. Now, with this answer, you go back to the original text, and you mask that answer in the text. Now, you can already see that that left side, the text, is a little like a question. It's a, essentially a question that is written in a sentence way. I would call this a closed question from here on, uh, which is a common term for this. But I also sometimes say this is a fill the gap question. Um, then, using that closed question, we're producing a natural question. And again, that's where essentially the magic is. I'll dig a bit more in a second. Notice that this process here, you can think about this as machine translation between two languages, the language of closed questions and the language of natural questions. So it is a form of machine translation, which means we can use machine translation technology to solve this, this problem. Right, so let's talk a little bit about machine translation on a very high level. Um, if you look at how a machine translation model works on the Facebook platform or anywhere right now, it's essentially like this. You have two sort of neural networks in that machine translation model. And these blocks, they are neural networks here. Um, one is called the encoder, in this case, the German encoder. And this encoder takes the input and maps it to a vector representation of some sort, something that is actually easy to process for deep learning models. Um, so it, it represents the text in its internal representation kind of similar to how you might be translating in the sense that when you read something in your native language, you sort of internalize that, you turn it into something that isn't directly the text, it is your representation of the meaning of that text. That's what's happening, that's what's roughly happening in that encoder. And um, then you move this, uh, this representation to an English decoder, which takes that representation and then produces the actual English from it. These two, network together, these two neural networks together, they actually do all the work. Now, for normal machine translation, you train these two neural networks using, again, large amounts of annotated data of language one and language two paired together, uh, which is the very thing we don't want to use at this point, uh, because for our problem, this would mean pairs of closed questions and actual natural questions, which are also still costly to get. Luckily, there has been quite substantial progress, as I mentioned, in what is called unsupervised machine translation in the last uh, year or so. Um, for example, by Guillaume Lampel and uh, colleagues at, at FAIR Paris. And the way that unsupervised machine translation works is, is like this. You create training data for your machine translation model by actually just using data 
unlabeled data on either language. For example, you use a English sentence, which you can get for free. You just need a collection of English sentences. And this English sentence um, you use to produce a, first of all, what I call a noisy example. And this noisy example will train part of the neural network. The noise is essentially, in many cases, just a wiggling of the English words that you had in the original sentence. So you're going to reorder randomly the sentence, shuffling them a bit, maybe omitting some words. So that's a new type of language that uh, isn't really German. Um, but it is something that if you give this information as training data to your machine translation model, it will learn at least on the right side, on the decoder side, to produce good-looking English from something that isn't English. So this data helps our decoder, the English decoder, to get better at, uh, at language at language production, even though it might not be for the right input language that we care about. Then you can take the same or different, again, unlabeled single sentence and map it to a German sentence, sorry, a German input sentence using a English to German machine translation system. So if you had that, then you could create data like this. Uh, obviously, you don't have an English to German machine translation system either because, well, for that you would need that supervised data. But in order to get this, you can essentially just turn around the whole game and uh, do the same thing, but now translating from English to German. And if you iterate these two things, these two steps, for a while, the data will look more and more like real German slash real English data when you or align real German and real English data when you do it. And that's partly because the way that these machine translation models work is that they, they can essentially translate the input text sort of word by word, which is obviously a terrible idea in most language pairs. Uh, I mean, even English and German, which are sort of close, it still wouldn't work. Uh, plus, it would look weird. But once you, have, um, once you have translated things word by word, it's just a matter of sort of reordering these words such that they look really close to English. And in a way, that process of translation is actually not uh, too hard. It's obviously not solving the problem, and a unsupervised machine translation model isn't quite at the same level as the supervised ones. But in some languages, it actually gets quite close, which, is, which I think is remarkable. Now, showed you how to do this for machine translation. The way you do this for question answering is pretty much the same thing. Now you're just translating closed questions to natural language questions, and you, you know, using, for example, sentences or sort of questions, unlabeled questions from the web, things with a question mark, as the unlabeled training data for this, for this method. And likewise, you use unlabeled sentences with mask tokens as the sort of examples of the closed question language that you need for this thing to work. And then you do the same thing. You take natural questions, you um, wiggle them a bit. Um, sorry, that's actually the, the wrong thing. That should be a wiggled version of the, uh, of the input question. Um, and uh, you use the question to close machine translation system to produce actual mass questions from natural questions. And then you keep on doing this in iteration until you converge at some point. And uh, that works relatively well. So just to give you a few example translations that you can do with this natural question to close question translation system. Um, for example, it took the closed question to record the six album in question, question, question mark uh, to when did they record the six album, which is pretty decent. Like it learned how to add question words to do some minor syntactic modifications to make this actually sound like a real question. Um, not uh, 
the most complex task, but it did this without any actual direct supervision. Um, it did some other interesting things. For example, it turned established the renowned Paradise Studios into when, where is the renowned Paradise Studio, which isn't necessarily what you always want, but uh, it's an example of the kind of process that happens in these models. Uh, it did some interesting things about, say, turning a selling thing into a buying thing, which still actually kept the right meaning. Um, but it also did a lot of nonsense. Um, for example, he speaks question mark, question mark, question mark, English and German, and somehow turned that into what are we, German and English? Which I think uh, is a good question to ask in these days. Um, to give you a high-level overview of the results, I think uh, I'll separate the results into, again, results for models that use no Q, C, and A training data at all, Oop, I'm sorry. and results for models that use hundreds of thousands of examples. And on the no data front, we have the human who does remarkably well. Um, this is really very impressive. Uh, here's a simple heuristic that essentially takes the question and scans like word by word over the context and finds just word matches between the possible answers in their context and the actual question, which works okay. Um, here is previous work that works a little better. And here is our unsupervised approach that has really sort of improved this, uh, this number quite a bit, primarily through this idea of close to uh, natural question translation. Now, that's far away from human performance, and I think it will take a long time until we can do this in an unsupervised way at the level that humans can do it. Um, but it is at least already better than a supervised but simple approach that back when this data set that we did the evaluation came about was created, uh, was proposed. So a, a so-called logistic regression model that uses standard feature-based uh, approaches to do this task. It actually already does better than the supervised approach. On the other hand, it's also still quite far away from a supervised uh, and deep modern model. In a way, everything that I just said is also somewhat un unrealistic and again, not really a concern for varying because the context that uh, the question answering model is given is usually what I call a gold context or gold document. We know that this document has the answer for the question that we're looking at. And we also know that there are no other sort of noisy documents in that bag of documents that could have other competing answers or, or things that are completely irrelevant. So this is also a very um, artificial setup. If you actually take back all the data that we're actually trying to uh, skim through and trying to make sense of, and you mix these things together and then ask the machine to do machine reading with all of this data, again, performance drops quite substantially. Um, so, in fact, if you look at the numbers we're getting for reading all of Wikipedia, essentially by taking a information retrieval system that takes the query, finds the relevant documents, and then uses whatever technology I just showed you, then performance drops to half to around 46% as well, which is really far from being very usable. I think there are different ways to go about this. I think one way is just to build better retrieving systems, use more supervised data to train the retriever and to train the question answerer better and better. I think that's a reasonable way to go. But I think it might be a local optimum in the sense that at least as far as humans are concerned, that's not quite how we read. Like I think when, when we read things, we internalize them somehow and then they become part of our internal memory and become useful for 
things later on, and we don't have to constantly refer to an open book and, and search through the web every time you ask me a question. We do that sometimes. We certainly externalize some of our knowledge, but a lot of knowledge we just have at our hands. And maybe we need to get better at getting machines to represent their knowledge in this sort of internal representation. So there might be a global optimum that looks at the problem in a really different way. I don't know what that is, obviously. Um, if I knew, I would just do that. But what we're currently doing is try to investigate a few other options and looking at, at different approaches to reading that, again, require less supervision, ideally almost no supervision, but also internalize the knowledge that is read in a like, much more compact and accessible way. So this is what this work is about. Um, in particular, it's about knowledge in Muppets. And I don't know if this makes any sense to you as a title. Who, who can make sense of this title at this point? That's great. Um, so you learn in, in a second um, why there is knowledge and what kind of knowledge there is in Muppets. All right, so yeah, should be good. So there has been, in natural language processing, a revolution in pretty much the last year. Things have changed so dramatically, uh, like uh, I think they haven't, haven't for a while, maybe with the rise of, of deep neural networks a couple of years ago, but uh, things have really changed. Just to il illustrate this for you, like around 2018, if you looked at a natural language processing task, if you wanted to do something, you would most likely do it this way. You would take your input text and you would map each token in that text to some kind of so-called word vector. And this word vector is representing the meaning of that word in a low dimensional vector space, such that, for example, Tesla and Newton might be sort of close and Tesla and some politician might be further away or born and birth might be really close, but born and eating is not so close, et cetera, et cetera. And you do this for all your tokens. Then you feed these vector representations into a neural network. And then you ask that neural network, OK, use that information to predict, for example, the document label of that uh, text. So for example, predict that this is a science document. So that's great. And it worked relatively well. But one thing that it did was it would take any other sentence uh, that mentioned the same word and map that also to uh, a label. And the words that are identical in these sentences would be mapped to the same vectors. So the Tesla in Tesla was born in and the Tesla in Tesla was bought by, they would have the same vector, which is Unfortunate because clearly they're, they're different things and they should lie in different spaces. And what would happen is that your downstream model might get confused by that. Right? It thinks, okay, maybe this is still about science because it's still about this guy Tesla in this case based on the vector information that we're providing it. Now, today, this looks quite different. So today, we have the input and we have the vectors and the vector for Tesla would look different to the vector for um, Tesla in the context of that Tesla being a person. And the way that we do this today is by another neural network that when it produces the vector for Tesla, doesn't just look at the word Tesla in isolation, it looks at the whole sentence and then produces a vector for Tesla. Hence, using the information that there is maybe a buying mentioned in the neighborhood, which means that this is most likely not about a person being bought, but about a company being bought. And hence, there should be a different representation for, for that vector. These models, the ones that uh, produce the contextualized vectors for the input tokens, they have been, for some odd reason, named after Muppets in, uh, in the Sesame Street and in, in the Muppet Show. 
So one of the first models that did this was called the ELMO model, and the current best model which does that is called the BERT model. And uh, these models have really changed the game in terms of the performances we see across the board for a lot of problems. So if you look at every sort of NLP problem, they, they jump by amounts in terms of accuracy increases uh, that were really hard to imagine a couple of years ago. And where, so a guy like a few years ago would write papers about improving the accuracy by 0.5 to 1% on one particular task. Uh, the papers that came out, they improved the performances by sometimes three to four, four to five to 10 percentage points across 10 tasks. So uh, super exciting, also somewhat frustrating, but uh, it's still a really interesting time to do NLP. Now, the whole trick to these isn't so much the neural architecture in these networks, the thing that, that, that actually does the mapping. It is how you train these contextualized Muppets to do what they do. Because you can train them again without labeled data. The only thing you need is unlabeled text. Roughly, the way they work is like this. You're given some unlabeled English text, for example, and you choose within that unlabeled text some word, randomly, say born. Then you mask that word in the sentence and ask the neural network to re-predict it. And this task forces that network at the bottom, the thing that moves or maps vectors, sorry, words to their contextual vectors, forces it to somewhat understand the sentence, forces it to understand that James, for example, must be some kind of person because it's, it's persons who are born, uh, right? So it, it, will, it will just see a lot of examples like that to learn that Jameses are persons and that born is something associated with persons and et cetera, et cetera. So you can do this with billions of sentences. Really, there's no stopping this. And in fact, what we did at FAIR this year is we've been just investigating how much do we or can we improve these, these models further by just adding more and more data. And they do improve and improve. So really, uh, what you've seen as the state-of-the-art method in unsupervised QA that I showed earlier when I, looked, uh, when I gave you that, uh, that table, that's essentially a so-called BERT model. Now, in this context, what we've been interested in is to, to ask, what if this type of learning to predict missing words on unlabeled data is some form of internalizing? And what if BERT actually has read, by doing this type of um, training, has read the web or all the documents at sea at a, at a massive scale? One way to test that is to just come up with questions, uh, with factual questions, which we can generate from database of facts, and then run these through pre-trained BERT models, or pre-trained ELMO models, or pre-trained whatever Muppet models. So if I give to a pre-trained Muppet a close question like this, will it produce the right answer? Um, and it turns out, in practice, it quite often does. So these things have read and somewhat internalized part of what, they, uh, what they've been trained on. Um, so we did a study to investigate this a bit better and looked at the precision or fact precision. Like if you ask Bert, um, what's, uh, what do you think? Where did Tesla study? Then you can get the answers and rank them and you can calculate sort of the precision at each rank. So how, does those, how do those precisions compare to um, some other kinds of ways to extract knowledge from text? Um, we look at a simple frequency baseline. That's just saying for whatever question you have, like place of birth, just use as an answer the most frequent birth. Actually, that's fairly good, which is somewhat disappointing. So uh, that's partly because there's a bias in Wikipedia 
that a lot of famous people are born in, say, London. So if you, um, if you actually just return London as the answer to where was X born, then that's not a bad answer as far as getting accuracy is concerned. Um, we compared it to essentially this traditional way of machine reading I described earlier. Like you take all the text, you map it to a graph by machine-machine translation, by translating natural language into machine language. And we found that to work quite poorly. And that's sort of in line with what I said in the very beginning. These things aren't very accurate, and they don't yet have really the recall that we need. We then try to help that system a lot by being very, very generous. So essentially, we ask that uh, machine, machine translation system to do the simplest possible thing and everything else we did. And then it got a bit better. Uh, and it was much better than the so-called ELMO model. But it was actually even at that point where we helped it so much, it was still only marginally better than the BERT model, which had no labeled training data. It had nothing that, that designed it to be a knowledge reading mechanism. It was just a, uh, a way to pre-train this contextual embedding method on uh, a lot of unlabeled data. So we were quite excited about that. Like, that's uh, really quite impressive for a system that hasn't been designed to do any of that. Uh, we also looked at the actual task of question answering, as I showed you before, where we compared it to a retrieve and read method. Uh, this is what I talked about. You first retrieve the three documents. Then you use neural end-to-end -end machine learning to, uh, to come up with an answer. And unfortunately, here it doesn't do as well yet, uh, at least when you look at something that is called precision at one. How accurate is the first answer that you return? But if you look at precision at 10, like essentially how likely in the first 10 predictions of the systems is the correct answer, both of these approaches, the retrieve and read and the Muppet style approach, actually work relatively similarly, which again, I think is, is quite impressive. There are a lot of assumptions that we make in this work about the kinds of answers these models uh, are allowed to give. And so I think all of that is not saying um, these Muppets can replace knowledge bases yet. But I think uh, there might be one way to go about this in the future. So to give you a few examples of what this model is doing, like if you'd say Adolf Adam died in, it correctly predicts the bold answer of Paris, which is great. Now, I kind of like this example because it looks like it knows this, but does it know it or does it guess it? Because if I give you a French sounding name and I ask you um, where was that person born, your best prior is probably Paris. So it actually makes me think a lot about what it means to know and what it means to guess. Like if it does this kind of guessing and it does it really well, does it know it uh, or do we care? Um, I guess the question is, how do these things work a little further on the tail when you look at less obvious things where people aren't uh, born in Paris? Um, and uh, in that case, they get a little worse, but uh, still often return the right answer. Um, it also produces the wrong answers. So, so what you can see is that it really has a good sense of what's the right type of answer, but not necessarily what the answer is. So it always knows that. And it kind of resonates with what I said in the beginning of what these kind of things learn. Tesla is a person. Tesla is a company that it can get. Maybe not always the exact details about the knowledge. It also has sort of general common sense knowledge, which is quite, quite nice. All right, so let me conclude. I think machine reading and question answering is still very hard. Um, we need massive supervision data sets. And that holds not just for those two tasks, it holds for pretty much most of the problems today you're looking at and that you're trying to solve with deep learning. So I um, think that's super relevant across the, across the board. Uh, but we can now reach at least early supervised results without supervision, which I think is a good step forward. Uh, also, we need small focused document sets to do reading. Like if I give you the answer, essentially, by giving you the document that has the answer, then our neural models are pretty good at you know, extracting the actual answer. 
But you could also ask, like, at this point, why do we still need this? If, if I need to give you that paragraph, I can just read that paragraph myself. Um, so when you look at a broader set of documents and you actually do large-scale machine reading, things look much different. Uh, but what we've found is that these so-called pre-trained language models, or Muppets, they just model language by training on unlabeled data. Uh, they don't need these focused document sets at all. They have all the knowledge stored in their parameters, and I think they have promising accuracy. But there are many, 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 many open problems in machine reading um, that uh, we're still far from solving as well. Uh, for example, reasoning, taking several documents and then integrating information from those, like that accounting example. That's actually not possible today, uh, as, as sad as it sounds. Um, also, robustness to variations in the input. If you change the input a bit to one of the questions or the, uh, the answers or the, sorry, the context, results often get substantially worse. So I think there's a lot to be worked on. And with that, I'm happy to conclude. <laughs>